So I'd like to thank uh, Ajahn Kovilo and Ajahn Nisipo for inviting me. This is my first first visit here. I've been to Seattle once or twice before, but not to a, a meditation group, to a sangha. Also welcome to the Zoom community over there. Thanks for checking in. This is new to me, Zoom. I, I gave it gave a talk or a meditation retreat on Vancouver Island last weekend. And there was the Zoom community there. They kept interrupting my meditation with that question. <laughs> Who, who's that? Yeah, so. I can move it closer to me? Yeah. I have a very soft, soft voice, so let me get it right there. Okay. Good. I haven't said anything yet, so. <laughs> Yeah, well, that uh, the guided meditation I did, kind of paying attention to neutral feeling. A uh, quick story behind that was, I guess it was five years ago at Abayagiri, right before I left, is when the huge wildfires on the West Coast really started. And uh, you weren't there at the Abayagiri, were you at the time? No. Um, but yeah, a huge fire came in and we were evacuated for a week and the fires came and burnt right up to the edge of our property, burnt 75% all the way around the monastery. And the firefighters had a good portion in keeping it from going any further, but, and also our next door neighbors, a Catholic monastery where I learned how to do icon painting and same thing, the fire kind of wrapped around their monastery as well, but uh, didn't, didn't burn anything. And the, the particular day that it happened, I was one of the, uh, senior monks there. I was a senior sort of resident monk who was there. All the other senior monks, Sajjan Pasano in particular, were traveling. And uh, it was funny, uh, two in the morning, three in the morning, someone came up and just knocked with about that amount of enthusiasm on my on my door and said, Jody Paulo, there's a fire. We all need to gather at the uh, monk's utility building. So I was like, okay, I'm up. I'll, I'll be there. So I folded my bedding, put it all away, put my, you know, blanket away and I had a sewing project so I got that and put it in my my backpack and and opened the door about 10 minutes later there was a thousand foot wall of flames uh, on the ridge it's right across from us and I got we have a picture of our neighbor took a uh, or one of our contractor at the time took a picture from the other side of the fire and it's like thousand foot peaks um, all around us there, and the fire's on the valley that's higher than those mountains. So it was it was a thousand foot flame, and my very first thought was that could be my death. Very first thought that could be my death, and the second thought was is, and you got to get thirty people out of this monastery. You know, so I just jumped immediately into work mode, and uh, and so. We obviously, well, not obviously, but we, we survived, we made it. There's a lot of stories about that. But then about two months later, I'd already been planning to leave Abayagiri, and I went up to our hermitage in White Salmon with Ajahn Siddhanto at the Pacific Hermitage, and we were just started a winter retreat. And I remember sitting there in meditation, and I was scanning my body, looking for unpleasant sensations so I could try to resolve it so I could have a nice, peaceful meditation. And this thought came into my mind, which probably wasn't 100% valid, but the thought came in and said, what a selfish bastard you are. You know, it's like, you know, like 12 of your neighbors died in that fire. And like, I think over 300 homes were destroyed. And you couldn't for a couple of months afterwards go to any, you know, you went to any store, you know, to buy something or whatever we were doing. And always the first question was, how are you doing? You know, did, you, you know, did you lose any property? And almost every single person we met had some relative in the area that, that was affected deeply by the fire. And so I was like, you, know, you just, 12 of your neighbors died and there's all these people who are really, their lives are in turmoil and you're worried about a pain in your knee. How selfish. <laughs> so I actually remembered 
I don't know if it's actually 100% true, but I heard once Ajahn Sumedho uh, was teaching a winter retreat at Amravati, and he took neutral feeling as the, the subject for three months, talked about neutral feeling for three months. And I, I think I heard that the Ajahn Amaro maybe had all these tapes and was trying to transcribe them. And the cabin he was in, or trailer he was on, caught on fire, and so they lost all the, the information. So it's always intrigued me. Really, you could, take, you could talk for three months about neutral feeling. So I just decided on my own, so I'm going to do that for our winter retreat. I just started paying attention to neutral feeling. So I had this joke for a long time. It was like something would bother me. You know, someone would say something, I'd be upset about it, or I'd have to view an opinion about something. And I would just say, what does my right elbow think about that? You know, it's like, it's pretty neutral. There's not, unless you bang it, it's like, it's, you know, we don't think about our elbows. So I just, that was my joke. What does my elbow think about that? And it was quite fascinating that that's when I kind of came up with this thought that actually really only about 5% of my life is really extremely enjoyable. It's maybe only like 1% or 2%. And really only 1% or 2% of my life is painful. But it's like, yeah, but why am I always looking for the painful? Why am I always bringing that into my awareness and focusing on that? So just by bringing it to the neutral, two things happened that just totally blew me away. One is that over doing this over a period of time, by focusing on the neutral, I started noticing that these two extremes on the, on the sides started getting bigger and bigger. It's almost like they were wanting my attention. And so after a short period of time, maybe two weeks or a month, I started noticing about 33% of my experience was quite joyful and blissful even. And I just would see, you know, the, the green, you hear like people have near death experiences and they go out and they see the grass is green and you just have these overwhelming experiences. And I was having that daily, you know, 33% of the time, just noticing the sound of birds or, uh, you know, something pleasant, just the feel of the, the wind coming, the subtle movement of the air in this room and just really being blissed out by that, which, you know, today it's kind of neutral having that feeling. Um, but then also, kind of on a negative con con consequences of that, 33% of my experience became very painful. Um, and yeah, just uh, you, you'd see you're opening up more to actually really experiencing um, sorrow and lamentation and, or pain. And it wasn't usually so much about like myself, but just noticing it in the world, just sort of noticing um, somebody else when they were in, in pain or um, feeling like yeah, if somebody, yeah, instead, of, instead of somebody like being rude to us, feeling hurt by that, you'd see that as like, that person's really suffering. Like, why would they have said that? And it would just be this really painful sorrow inside of me. So it was like 33% of my experience was more open to that. But what I said was because I was focusing on neutral feeling, which I think is really, really strongly associated with equanimity, there wasn't any fear of it. There wasn't any pushing that away. It was just allowing it to be there and not, not reacting to it at all. I just seeing that is the human condition. That is the potential, either the joy, the neutral, or the, the unpleasant. And so then when actually Ajahn Kovilo you know, pointed that out, that just being aware of whatever sensation you're in, that is even pleasant. So even just knowing that the, uh, the, the situations that were more painful is completely okay to be there. And um, so it's, yeah, it's just like, it actually took a couple of years for that to, to kind of level out. And right after we did this retreat, I moved up to Ajahn Sona's monastery in Birkin Monastery. And I had the good fortune for a year just to be on retreat. And I was going for really, really, really long walks every day, just, just getting out in nature. And I had this one insight. I, I came back and told Ajahn Sona that I would be out on these long walks and I'd just come into a meadow. And like I say, this kind of experience of coming in and just, you know, seeing the green and just seeing the, the tranquility of it and just really almost going into like a blissful state. And I told Ajahn Sona, I said, it's so hard to, like I was doing a lot of crying. And I said, it was kind of, interesting because it's like I think what people want to get in life to be to be happy 
like, you know, we've got into, maybe we've gotten into these where we work 60, 80 hour weeks, we're trying to make money so we can go off and be happy. And I said, it's so much simpler than that. It's just go out in the forest and look at a tree. <laughs> it's impossible for me to describe it, but it's just like, it's so simple. And uh, Ajahn Sona said one, one of his wisest things he's ever said to me, which was, he said, trees are like cats. He said, if you are content, a cat wants to sit in your lap. But he said, and trees are the same. He says, if you go out into the forest, you know, like you're trying to heal yourself, or you're, you're trying to get something, trying to acquire something, those trees will recede. You know, the further you walk into the forest, the further they're going to go away from you. But if you go into a forest content, it's just going to, it's going to, the branches are going to caress your head as you walk by them or you know, give you a pat on the shoulder as you walk by. And you just, you're going to feel welcome. You're going to feel content. Well, you are content, so you're just, you're feeling this love from the forest. And so it was, it was, it, I, I told later, so it was so sad because like, how do you teach that? <laughs> how can you how can you convey that to people? And just recently, I, I did an interview with Ajahn Sona. I'm getting ready to go down to the Sierra Mountains. I'm gonna. Um, I've been talking about this for about four years, going down to the Sierras. I had this original idea with sort of my interest in icon painting. I've got a lot of friends who are Catholic monks and. I was trying to talk one or two of them into hiking with me. I wanted to, at the time, hike the entire, like, say, Pacific Crest Trail. And I wanted to make a movie of the two of us walking together in, in an intermonastic, interfaith dialogue. Just, uh, I'd, I've been to a few monastic uh, conferences where we talk about celibacy or we talk about some of our practices, but we're at a conference table and we're presenting papers, and I was like, no, let's go out in the forest and help each other set up a tent. You know, let's uh, get to a river crossing that we could die if we don't do this right. And, you know, two people trying to you know, put their heads together, you know, just completely different faiths, different religions, and just working together, living together, practicing together, praying together, and document that. And so I've been talking about this and trying to create the conditions for it to happen. And I think this past fall, Ajahn Son was getting sick and tired of me talking about it. And so he said, uh, here's the seed money to get down there. He goes, You're, I'm kicking you out of the monastery. <laughs> and so I've got enough support that I can do it for, for two months. So I'm going to July and August, I'll be down in Sierras and uh, several people uh, are going to be, be helping out with that. And, uh, but I did an interview with him um, just talking about how I should use that time, like what what's one way to talk about it, and and he uh, he made I, I thought it was lovely his little comment. He looked at me, he goes, "You're a by nature, you're a nature mystic." If I had, uh, I would have considered myself to be an icon painter kind of uh, artist, and I I've been trying to develop for the last 15 years, or I talk about it quite a bit how to use art and creativity as a meditation subject, and. Yeah, but then when I got to Burke and just doing all this walking, I just you know, I just love being outdoors. And he said that because I, I showed him this, these videos. I tried to do a, uh, I think it was February and March, I was on a kind of a private uh, solitary retreat there at Burke. And, and I was trying to film a little bit of like what it is to be on retreat there. You know, like you still have to do your laundry, you still have to wash your dishes and just showing stuff like that. And the weather was really bad, so I was filming myself sitting in meditation in their, in their hall. And I had these couple of really nice shots where the, the sun is over here, and then as it goes through, you know, through an hour period, it actually goes across my body and ends up over here. And it was just kind of a nice sort of, as a time lapse, it was like you know, 20 seconds, but it kind of shows the movement, the movement of time. Yeah, but I'm sitting there, and when you do a time lapse, like you know, as you're sitting here meditating, just you know, a little bit of movement like that, you know, you don't feel it in, internally in your body, but when you watch it on time lapse, it's like, you know, you're just like, well, like Jody Paulo doesn't know how to meditate, does he? And so I was like, oh, I can't use those. And I, because of pride, yeah, because of my pride, I couldn't show this. And, but then I uh, started, uh, I was thinking, well, I'm going to be out in the Sierras, you know, for two months and basically outside 24 hours a day for that period of time. I need to start meditating outdoors. And so I started, oh, I do that a lot anyway, do a lot of walks, but I meditate. 
and I, when I'm doing it, I have a tripod and, a, and an iPhone, and I do a lot of time-lapse photography. You know, where Birkin is, it's kind of a, you know, it's a high plateau, so they get these really strange cloud formations, and, and so I, I do a lot of filming of that. And I just decided, well, I'm doing this sort of film of like what it's like to be on retreat, so I started including myself in the, in the, the videos just to see if it would work out. And I noticed, kind of to my shock, when I was meditating outdoors, I didn't move. I was completely solid, you know, for even an hour meditation. It's like, and then it just, it struck me, so I showed that to Ajahn Sohn, and that's when he said, you're a nature mystic. That's your element. You need to, you know, create the conditions where you can be outdoors and meditate. And, and he said, what it is, he says, when you're inside and you're kind of doing this, he says, you don't want to be there. You want to be outside. And then when you're outside, you're content. And so just, you know, learning that about yourself. The other thing Ajahn Sona says about sort of meditation advice is that it's like we each have a time of day that we you know, consider to be our time. Some people are night people, I am. Um, some people are morning people, I don't understand you. Um, <laughs> some people are afternoon people. You know, just, we all have our time, that's, that's our time. And he said what you should do is try to structure your life that you're alone during that time and meditate or whatever it is that you're interested in, whatever it is, you know, if you're an artist or a, a writer or um, you, know, you just love solitude or you, you like hiking or being outdoors, you know, try to, try to schedule your life so you can be alone during that time and then and, and to meditate during that. Because you'll, he said you'll go deeper into your, your meditation. And it's like, well, I like, the way I think about it is like, yeah, if, you, if I don't feel good in the morning, well, that's when I should be doing stuff I don't want to do anyway. It's like, yeah, that's when I'll clean the dishes or clean the house or, do, do the chores that I have to do. So then when, the, when I do feel good, that's when I meditate or that's when I uh, go for uh, or my, my icon painting or creativity, I'll do that at that time. So that's a, a really good piece of advice that Ajahn Sona gave. And how much time do I still have? I can keep going, yeah. I was li listening to Ajahn Sona this uh, I guess it was last summer. He did a actually a retreat on using the elements and uh, and casino. There's very little that's kind of out there about using those as meditation objects. And so I've just really started working on working on this. I don't feel totally qualified to, to talk about them, even though that is my starting to become my practice is working with the elements. And it was interesting. I was talking to a, this group in, in Vancouver, and. The, the two areas that really kind of excite me or what, where I feel alive when I, when I meditate is creativity. And so it's a, you know, this very traditional Christian iconography. But before that, I painted for many, many years just using um, fabric paint that you'd like iron onto a t-shirt. And I did like 10 years with working with that. And then, um, and then now it's the uh, yeah, sort of working with being out, outdoors and being in nature. And it's interesting to me that I just know, as, well, the way I described it was when I was doing, especially doing the, when I started doing the icon painting, it's a really slow process and uh, really slowly building up all the different layers on your, on your board that you're working on. And the only time I really had to devote to be able to do it, because you need kind of a, a block of time, was after our evening pujas. And so I'd get back to my cabin about, nine o'clock. And I knew that if I picked up my paintbrush, it was like turning on a light switch. And a light switch that had a timer on it. So like if I touched that paintbrush, I was gonna be awake for four more hours. And what happened was, and I, I discovered this pretty early on, is when I sort of engaged that part of my consciousness, I could feel my entire brain light up. There was, it was like, yeah, say the light switch is not a, not a bad analogy. And, and so yeah, that created some problems, especially when you live in a community that gets up at five in the morning. <laughs> and uh, so that's one of the reasons I ended up leaving because I, I, I needed to set up a structure where I could kind of follow that more. And, but I noticed the same thing happens when I'm meditating outdoors. I think there's just many more, you know, the, the sense, could, you could figure out a way to do it indoors, but your senses are just much more alive. It's like the, there's more movement of the air, there's more sense, there's more 
dangers too. It's like there could be animals walking through or, and so, but I just find that when I meditate outdoors, I'm just much more alive. And I think that's what Ajahn Sun was saying, interest, you know, like that's what interests me and then enjoying it. And so there's, there's the interest and enjoyment. So that's why those meditations work for me. And so I think it's, it's a, um, yeah, I encourage people to experiment. Like we may have been taught one way of meditation is like just doing breath meditation or doing a, you know meditation, but experiment and find out what really interests you. Or if you have an interest, like, well, how could I take that and make it into a meditation? And I'll end with this story. I just I was listening to a talk of Ajahn Sona's and he told this story and um, it's from the suttas. You might know the name of the monks, but uh, there's, there's a monk who's is ordained and has a, a Maha, um, Sariputta has his teacher, who is the chief disciple of the Buddha, known for wisdom, a Maha Sariputta is. And he has a student who's uh, a sensualist. He, just, he really is into beauty and um, you know, fine refinery, and, and Sariputta notices this. And usually the kind of the antidote for someone who's a sensualist. And you'll often hear that like, oh, you know, as a Buddhist, I shouldn't have pleasure. You know, I shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be pursuing pleasure. That's a, that's a negative thing. And, and it can, it can be distracting. We can kind of get attached to, to beautiful things and, and create hassles for ourselves. And so Sariputta gives them the instructions on how to um, contemplate the, the internal body organs and death contemplations and cemetery contemplations. And this monk does, did not respond very well to this. He started uh, uh, kind of losing interest and, and he's kind of, you know, felt his, his living the holy life was getting more and more difficult. And maybe having Sariputta as his teacher, the, he was around the Buddha as well. And the Buddha kind of noticed this about this monk and he asked him how he was, how he was doing, how he was faring, and the, the monk told him, you know, it's like, I'm not doing so well. And so the, the Buddha could see his past lives. And so he realized that in this life, he had been a goldsmith. And not only in this life, but in many previous lives, he'd been in a family that, uh, that made, made jewelry and refined gold. And so this monk was kind of in love with gold, enamored with gold. And not, in a, not like wanting to possess it, but just, just loved the qualities of gold. And so the Buddha had a, a set of, someone had just given him some bright yellow lilies. And so the, the Buddha gave these to him and told him to go down to this, this kind of marsh, kind of pond area that was near them and told him just to meditate on these. And so the monk went down and set the lotuses in front of him and, and just stared at them. And he went into jhana. He went into this really deep state of concentration just based on this joy that was that was coming from him, and just uh, yeah, based on just the casino, the vision of this this gold color, and then after his meditation, he went back to the Buddha and he thanked him. He said, uh, um, "I understand now how to live the holy life. You know, now that I you know, now that he could get into a deep state of concentration and enjoy his meditation." Well, then uh, a few days later the monk kept going down to that, that little pond area and was meditating and some of the local village kids were gathering flowers in, around the, the pond and some lilies and they saw the monk there and they just had grown up in that kind of tradition of knowing how to pay respects like bringing these gold flowers right here and, uh, and so they, the children brought over a bunch of white lilies and set them down in front of the monk. And he, he kind of heard them and he opened his eyes and you know, acknowledged them and then was contemplating these, these lilies and went into a deep state of concentration and sat the entire rest of the day. And just as it was you know, probably getting to be dusk, he opened his eyes. Well, these flowers that had just been sitting there on the ground all afternoon had wilted and started to shrivel up. And then the monk saw, the, you know, saw this and when he opened his eyes and it, it kind of shocked him you know, because he'd been contemplating probably pure white, the, the casino of white and the purity of that and just, you know, got totally absorbed into that. And then when he opened his eyes and saw death, and it, it, it caused his in, uh, full enlightenment. He got enlightened just by that shock of seeing that. And so, 
Mm-hmm. Ajahn Sona, when he's telling the story, is like, yeah, don't be afraid of pleasant. Don't be, don't be afraid of pl- things that are pleasurable, especially in your meditation. So if there's something that you do know interests you and brings you joy, explore that. Don't be afraid of that. Hi, I'm. Uh, my, I was wondering if you could tell a little bit more about how you use creativity as an object for meditation. Yeah, so I, I started to ex- explain that, and then I got sidetracked. <laughs> Which is, well, how I use it is one way, but how it works, I can't actually explain. That's what I was going to say. Is that with the the wandering practices I do, I, I call sauntering. And the, the, the working with creativity, um, I don't know, like people say, well, how does it work? I don't know how it works. I just know it lights up my brain, and then that's the favorable conditions for meditation. So even though it's like I've had these ideas of trying to create a retreat based on that, it, uh, I think the only way I could do it would be just to create the conditions for you to experience that and then see what happens for you. Like, I, don't, I can't explain how it works. But what I did with, when I originally, how many hours do we have? (laughs) I literally can talk to you about icons for like eight hours straight, all the different aspects of it. But um, when it started for me, I was an art major in college, but I went to a liberal arts college and never intended to be an artist. I wanted to, I wanted to eat. And so I wasn't that good of an artist. I was going to be able to do it on my own. Uh, just for survival, but so I actually hadn't done any painting for like five years after I um, sort of before I ordained, and when I got there, I think it was out. It was actually even after my fourth vasa. After four years being a monk, I went to go visit my parents, and I was getting ready to move up to Thunder Bay, Ontario, to go live with a monk named Ajahn Punadamo, and. I stayed at my parents for two weeks, which was 10 days too long and for, for them as well. And so, but my mom had, had these, uh, these, those cheap fabric paints. And so just to do something, I had this idea, of, I got an idea for four paintings I wanted to do. And I just got absorbed into it. I just went down and just started painting them and, and just noticed in myself just like how interested I was and how just uh, like time just ceased to exist. And so I paint, I'd finished those, I took them to the monastery, and I just was intrigued by that. So I decided that I would take on a practice for one hour every day. I would uh, just do a little bit of, of painting. And just noticing that um, what I said was like, before I started doing this, every morning in meditation, I'd be, I would just be asleep. I just, I was, I'm not a morning person. I don't understand you people. Um, and. Uh, but as soon as I started doing the icon painting, especially when I started doing the icon painting, with, and it was up till like one o'clock at night, I was only getting four hours of sleep, and I would wake up in the morning and I would just be wide awake. So it was not only did it turn on the the the, 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 the brain lighting up, but it had lasting effects, and uh, it would yeah, my meditation just in, increased all the way around. So it was I just took on this practice for an entire year. Uh, even though I've been an art student in college, I'd never learned how to do uh, portraits and paint and painting portraits. So I took on this uh, um, one photograph of Ajahn Chah, and I decided I would just keep painting it over and over. I probably painted it over a thousand times, and it was interesting to me. I kept learning more and more and more about that image. And you'd think like you paint it three times, you'd, you'd know that image, but and it's impossible for me to describe what I learned. But I just kept noticing there was interest, there was enjoyment, there was, and it was affecting my life. So I, I took on that, say I took it on for a year. Every day I just had to do some aspect, either drawing, even you know, like there were just days I'd notice. What I would learn would be like th- there were waves, you know, like some days I'd really want to be doing it and I might spend four or five hours doing it. And there'd be other days I'd just have aversion to it. And I would uh, yeah, still make myself do it for an hour. But it might even just be something like, okay, for an hour, I'm just going to clean my paintbrushes. You know, it's some aspect of that, that process. And that was a, one of the advices I got from an art professor of mine who said, never leave the studio in a bad mood or feeling bad about what you've just done. He said, because if you leave not feeling good, and 
take this with meditation as well. Like if you feel like you just miserable at meditation or you just didn't feel good, just do something in the last two or three minutes to make yourself feel good. Just even tell yourself, well, I actually put forth effort. You know, it's like I could have gone off and done something unskillful, but I chose to be here and do something at least neutral and I didn't cause any harm in the world by sitting here for however long you sat here and just say, and if there's any goodness from that, I share that to you know, a friend of yours who's in pain or you know, to the whole world. So you can feel good about that. And if you do that, then you're going to want to come back to your meditation. You're going you're gonna to feel good about it. So like he said, never leave the studio in a, in a feeling bad. So I was like, so I didn't want to paint. I just I just okay, let's, what can I do? I'll clean the... I also made these paintings into quilts. So I, I might do maintenance on the sewing machine or um, just sort, clean off the paint jars. And that rarely happened, but there were days I just didn't want to do it. But just noticing this, like the moods, like some days I want to do it, some days I don't want to do it. And this happened to them when I started doing the sauntering. I think this was really powerful, was when I left by Geary, uh, I'd been there for like almost 20 years. And I kind of, when I left, I kind of chose to leave. It wasn't, I wasn't asked to leave, but it was kind of my decision. And in, I think for the 18 years before that I'd been there, I always felt like it was probably where I was going to die. It still might be. But um, when I left, it was sort of like I'm stepping away from the known. There was a lot of uncertainty, anxiety, and anxiousness. And I started going on these long walks. And I remember the first time that sort of came up, that sort of feeling of anxiety. I started telling my, myself a story about it, like, oh, this is because you don't know where you're going to be, what the future is going to be. And then, of course, it went away. And then three months later, it came up again. And I started rehashing the whole story again. And then a couple months later, the story, that feeling of anxiety came up. And I, I started to see myself telling the story. And I was like, wait, this feeling that's going on in the body, it's actually not even anxiety. And certainly the story I'm wanting to tell myself about this, you know, I don't know what's going to be in my future, that was completely added on. It was just a physical sensation in the body. There was no, uh, it wasn't anxiety, it was just a physical sensation. And it was by putting myself into that same situation, this, the, this hiking every single, walking every single day, that I was able to see these different moods in the, in the, in the mind. And so as soon as I saw it was just a physical sensation, it was just like, hey, wait, this actually could have been caused by having too many cups of coffee this morning. But then the, the mind, just out of habit or being in other situations where you were anxious, having a very similar feeling, told me, okay, if you're feeling this feeling, that means you're anxious. And if, what are you anxious about? So as you can see, it's like three, four times removed from actually just a physical sensation that happened from having too many cups of coffee. And because there was nothing in my life that should have been causing anxiety. I was on retreat and very peaceful. So I was like, oh, I can see that. So that's the way all meditation works. So like if you have a meditation practice and you plug into it every single day, you'll start to notice these things. And it was easier for me to see it because there was really no responsibility and I was you know, completely um, you know, alone. And you had the opportunity to see it. But the, you know, the kind of the same thing happened when I was doing the icon painting. Like it just every single day, it's like, well, why is it that today I want to do it and yesterday I didn't? And so you can look at the mind and say, I don't want to do it. And you say, liar, <laughs> you wanted to yesterday. So you just, you, it's really impossible for me to describe like all the things I could learn, but it's just, uh, it's a, anything about meditation is probably lots, it's very, comp not complex, but it's deep. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I'm Judith. So typically when I do a body scan, I'll be like neutral, 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 neutral. Oh, little um, tightness in the abdomen, pinch in the hip. Like it's the, it's the unpleasant yeah. that draws my attention. Um, can you give some advice on noticing the neutral more? Like, would you pause in places where there's neutral feeling, or? Yeah, yeah good question. Yeah, I would uh, um, kind of, yeah, start off with just, yeah, complete, doing the body scanning, going through and just noticing what's there and what, uh, 
because yeah, some days it's like today it's like the, I was just being more aware of the heat of the body because I usually don't meditate like right after eating. So it was like it was a different experience for me today. So that I kind of found that interesting. And when I started meditating outdoors, Birkin can get pretty windy. And so it's like, I was, it's funny because I, I made a comment in one of my videos that it's like the air element is just like my least favorite. It just seems really abrasive. But right after having said that, I started paying more attention to it. It was actually what was energizing me and what actually was making me happy being there. So not the not real strong wind, but just the gentle breeze. I was like, oh, that's what I noticed my attention. So like as we were sitting here, I'm not sure where it's coming from, but I can just feel this very, very gentle breeze coming through, which is quite pleasant. That's and that's when I started noticing the 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 heat in my body because I could feel this fluctuation of the rising and falling of the that that sensation. Um, but yeah, I would sort of just do a complete scan of the body, see what's what's interesting. And sometimes what is interesting is a neutral feeling. Like it might be a strong sensation, like the heat coming out that wasn't wasn't unpleasant, it wasn't pleasant. So I, I considered it neutral, even though it was the prominent feeling that was there. And then I would just focus on that particular aspect. Or if, uh, um, I usually don't, I mean, I comment, I joke about like, what does my elbow feel? But it's like, whenever I bring my attention, there's almost, there's no, there's no feeling there. So that's kind of actually hard to meditate on because it's like, there's no, there's no interest there. It's like, there's nothing there. So it's finding a sensation that is really there but is, is neither, you're not craving it, you're not pushing it away. That's how I would describe a, a useful. Also too, it's like one of my other favorite meditations is loving kindness meditation. And so oftentimes if you've ever done a retreat, they'll tell you like when you get to the neutral, if you're doing the sort of Burmese style of using categories of people, when they get to the neutral person, they'll tell you, you know, like use the checkout clerk at the grocery store and this Thai monk that I, I was listening to said, no, the person has to be someone real, someone you actually know. It's like, the, you know, it's like, otherwise it just, it's like making somebody up, it's creating somebody in your mind. You know nothing about that person, at the, 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 the clerk. And uh, so I always look at it as if you're in a community of about 20 people, if you have a group of 20 people that you hang out with some club or um, work environment, there's going to be one person in that group that's sort of like, who's in charge, it might be like the teacher, or somebody's got the authority. There's gonna be one person there that you always wanna confide in and you can trust and that'd be like your best friend. There's always a neutral person that you know them, you don't, you don't really wanna hang out with them but you don't, you're not averse to them. And there's usually one person that's your antagonist who's always creating, making issues for you. So the, you know, so the neutral person really should be somebody you do know, you know their name, you know their life history, if you can find someone like that, the practice of loving kindness to, towards a neutral person will go deeper instead of just creating somebody. This other teacher, that, that teacher I also liked, he said, if you don't have an, uh, an enemy or a difficult person that you're sending loving kindness to, if you don't have that person in your life, don't create one. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to create an enemy just so you can do your meditation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the ways, I think what interests me is you described a lot of interests, whether it's nature or art and all these things. And, um, I wonder if you could comment on how you do that and how they all are focused on Nibbana or getting there. Cause in my own life, uh, the way I'm sort of working with renunciation, a lot of my old interests, they just keep falling away. And sometimes I'm suspicious of that because there's nothing much yeah. left, you know? Right. So I'm kind of struck you're doing a different approach. And because right. I, I think in lay life, it's easy to get distracted. Maybe in your life, it's not. So I tend to drop things. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's way Ajahn Sona kind of teaches more like that because he was a classically trained musician and, and uh, um, yeah, he, it's, it's actually kind of like, you know, there, there is kind of joy or there's interest in these kind of hobbies or whatever you're doing. And at a certain point, like when you are, like, it's like with the, that monk who was given the flowers, like once you kind of realized, you know, a way to get into jhana by doing that, then you really didn't need the flowers at that point. You know, you could actually just do it in your imagination. And so these things do drop away. 
So like, I actually haven't touched my icon paints in two years now. And because I, I still do just, what I found was it's actually like the, that sensation of sort of the, the brain lighting up. Um, that happens when I do icon painting and it happens when I was doing this what I call sauntering practice. But when I saunter, I don't want to do any painting. It just, it's just, uh, um, I'd rather be outside. I'd rather just be, you know, in, in the elements. Um, but when I'm icon painting, I don't want to get up out of the chair. And I might sit there for eight hours straight and it's not good for my body. Um, but it, it does, I'm getting the exact same thing from both of those, those exercises or things. So I just kind of discovered on my own that it's like, yeah, the icon painting, I could get into it, back into it in the future, and I might. But I felt like it was bad for my health. Um, so, I, so I actually have kind of stopped doing that. And I'm, I'm into videography now, which is kind of supporting the, the sauntering when I do that. And I'm actually losing interest in that as well. So I kind of developed that. Um, I was what I considered to be a self-described Luddite, um, break the machines, you know, sort of, um, I would get upset if I saw the monk with an iPhone, you know, just sort of, that was bad, bad monk and uh, bad nun, you know, and so, uh, but when I uh, started, uh, um, uh, when I started sauntering, I, I just started uh, taking the camera a little bit and I noticed that would actually, that's like, br it actually brought me into being much more aware of paying attention to where I was and I just noticed like the interest went into that. And I really kind of developed it because I wanted to do this sort of documentary hiking with a Catholic, Catholic monk. And I feel like now like I've, I've learned the technology, I've learned how to do it and, and kind of happy with the, with the results. And I'm only keeping my channel going, I have a YouTube channel, but I'm not plugging it, but uh, um, I only, uh, I only am keep doing it because um, when I'm in the Sierras this summer, I want to film kind of what I'm doing and just see if something actually might develop. But I'm just keeping the, the skills sort of um, live or just keeping them fresh in me. But I have a very strong suspicion I'm probably going to maybe stop stop that even because it, it is. It, it can be a hindrance or it can be a, a crutch. And so, but then with the, the, the sauntering, just being out, um, when I just actually started paying attention more towards, you know, when I saw those videos of myself sitting there and just how quiet I was, it's like I don't even feel like I have this real strong desire to go for, you know, eight mile, ten mile hikes anymore. It's like I'll go two or three miles from the monastery and there's a few places that are just, I really like sitting at. And so I'll just walk to those places and I'll end up sitting the whole afternoon. So it's, it is this simplification, simplification. But it is in the mind, I think it, it's, the mind's got to be if it has that interest, but it can be the interest in just the, uh, you know, whatever it is that brings us to stillness. And, and just to follow on that, I, yeah. I guess what I was kind of asking was how do you, um, in the middle, in the midst of that multiplicity, do you keep re-orienting uh, your uh, intention toward Nibbana? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I would say like, I usually I'm only focused, I, th I think it's, what you're saying. I, I really am not doing like say all those different interests that I have all at the same time. It, it usually does come down to like um, for the last two years I've really just been um, getting outdoors and being, being out in nature and using that as my meditation and not, not doing the, the iconography or you know, at the same time. Um, but uh, you know I do I think it is is uh, you know how it's leading to Nibbana is just that the mind is interested and it gets getting more and more peaceful. You're, you're just learning more and more um, ways that uh, you get distracted or you learn. Like with loving kindness meditation, the way I des describe this is, it's like, well, I think it's like you have the different uh, um, categories. It's like we start off with ourselves, just being able to wish ourselves happiness. Just uh, um, actually, it's, the definition of metta is actually non-ill will. So it's actually not this sort of feeling of being blissed out or being happy. It's just really just having an intention of non-harming. And so if you can sort of develop that within ourselves, just being peaceful and calm, uh, or you can get kind of happy doing loving kindness meditation. And when you're doing yourself sort of over and over again, this one teacher I was listening to, he says, you know, you need to be able to stay focused on that for 20 minutes without getting distracted, without getting lost. Because you'll, you'll be sitting there wishing yourself happiness, may I be happy, may I be healthy. And then all these thoughts will come up. It's like, you know, we self-sabotage it. You know, 
you're like, well, I'm not worthy, or, uh, or you get distracted by responsibilities or duties, and you start to learn these, like, how is it that I get distracted from my meditation? And you finally will hopefully be able to overcome that so you can stay. It's not that thoughts don't arise, um, but you just don't pick them up. It's like you just, you're sitting there and they go through you, but you stay with the, feet, the sensation of, of that you're developing with, with metta, and you stay with it for 20 minutes. And then the teacher says, at that point, then you go on to the next category. So you go to, like, your teacher. And what, what I find is, is that there's a completely different set of associations I have with my teacher that I do to myself. So there'll be other ways that I get distracted or I have judgments about my teacher or um, praises about my teacher that will get me distracted. And then you, you learn those. And then you go to a neutral person. And, of course, the neutral person is indifference. It's like they're neutral. So it's like it's hard to keep your awareness, hard to keep your attention there. And then you get to the difficult person. And, it's, you know, it's really hard to, you know, to stay loving kindness with that type of person. I was actually down in Portland and someone asked, how do you send loving kindness to a difficult person? And I actually had never thought about that. Um, and so I answered him and said, you don't. You actually, you, it, this teacher I was studying in Thailand says, you actually don't send loving kindness. And so I didn't understand what he was really saying, but in answering this question, what I realized is, is when you start developing that kindness, that goodness in your heart and you're developing that with yourself, it's really a sensation in yourself. You're learning to develop whatever emotional state you want to be in. If you want to be happy, you've developed it so much, you know what it's like, so you can just turn it on and it will. Or what it's like to be safe, or what it's like to be compassionate. You, you know what those feelings are, and you can, you can develop that in the moment. And so when you start doing another person, you're not actually sending it to them. What you're doing is, can I hold, so like, dear friend, can I hold Ajahn Nisipo in my mind also while I'm sending, while I'm feeling kindness within my own self and not get distracted, not start, you know, worry about him or what he's, you know, some aspect, or if it's a difficult person. Can I have that difficult person in my consciousness and also feel loving kindness? Can I feel that, that joy and happiness? And that, and if you can do that, so your question like how is this, how is it also leading to Nibbana? You know, at that point, if you can, do a meditation where you, you're feeling that, that sense of loving kindness through all of those different categories and you don't really lose that, that's like 45 minutes or an hour that you're kind of meditating, focused on one object. And you did that because it's joyful, it's pleasant, it's, it's uh, you know, nice and you, you've gotten, so you're really focused where you, you know, you're not getting distracted. And that may or may not lead you into jhana, deep states of concentration, but you're at the doorstep. You're, you're right there, and if the conditions are right that you will be able to attain jhana, you've, 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 you've created the conditions where it could happen. It doesn't always happen for everybody, but it, uh, um, so that's how these kind of meditations work. It's putting you at the doorstep to, to be a possibility. Thank you, Ajahn. I just want to um, yeah, mention that the Ajahn Jyoti Palo's kind of raising up art as a, a valid means or movement is, I think, really significant. Um, it's not emphasized a lot in the Theravada, but, you know, there's two different ways of interacting with, you know, sense objects, and there's tanha, which is feeding off of them, and then there's chanda, which is zeal and kind of this impulse to create and make whole. And just to see how, you know, Longpur Pasano says that first we become joyful and then our samadhi comes together and really seeing how so many of the monastics I know who have maintained their robes uh, and, and their holy lives have found some way of really cultivating this joy. And um, it goes unnoticed that the Buddhist uh, Terigata and Terigata, like the elder verses of the monks and nuns, um, it's the first major body of nature poetry in history because you had all of these uh, royal and uh, really well-educated um, princes and, uh, you know, uh, princesses, basically, um, going into nature. And if you read carefully the verses, uh, they're extremely sophisticated meter and all this. So it's been part of our tradition since the beginning. Um, but it's very nice to see it raised up again. I do think we may have to wrap things up about now. I would say what time it is, but we only just have a passcode we have to enter. 
and we don't know what it is. <laughs> so it's okay. I think we have time for one more question. Let's do it on Zoom, please. Uh, Zoom person, go for it. I always have trouble getting up my sound because it. Uh... The mouse moves around. Anyway, I just wanted to give a shout out to Jyoti Paulo. Um, I met you four years ago, Jyoti Paulo, when I was at Birkin. We talked uh, considerably. Um, I don't know if you remember me. I'm Sacha. Um, oh, you can't see me really <laughs> from where you're sitting. But anyway, I'm a creative type too. And um, for me, it comes in the form of cooking and fixing things and problem solving. And I find that's when I'm most happy. So I just wanted to say, Hello, and thank you for your talk today. We do have to wrap stuff up, I think. But that, that's a good point. So I, I talk about creativity in terms of the you know, artwork, but it's just like you know, gardening, uh, cooking. You know how you know beautiful you make the the, the entree or you know, just the ingredients you use, or even cleaning. Like we we spent a lot of time in. Thai forest monasteries cleaning. There's an art to cleaning, you know, and you come in and it just, uh, you see the effects on your mind. It just, it settles the mind. So, yeah, in any aspect, you know, writing or um, you, do, you can take an art and just like how you interact with other individuals, just really paying attention to that, you know, or speech. So, it's a, yeah, so I talk about it in terms of icon painting. So, thank you, Sacha, for bringing that up. <laughs>